so thank you very much, Chad. This is a, a, a truly amazing experience and to be invited for this annual lecture, uh, to have all of, you, all of you in attendance and to, uh, uh, to really enjoy uh, Belfast. It's, it's, it's been a highlight of my career, certainly, and I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm going to start out with just a little bit of organization and, and really, um, uh, again, express, express my heartfelt appreciation. Uh, the, the two areas that I thought I'd talk about today were, were one of the areas that I got started in working with Shad many years ago was, was, was on work, work and crime, work and reintegration. And so I, I'll say something about that as well but also fell into disenfranchisement and civic reintegration. Um, and I, I think there, there will be a, a good bit of, of US material here, but I really don't think at all that these, these issues, um, certainly not from, from what I've been discussing here, are, are limited to, to that, that context. Um, the orientation is here is um, in much of my work, and I think that much of the work of the people in this room, that, that um, we develop knowledge, um, we engage public debates, and we really strive uh, for a more just and peaceful world. Um, and that might sound hokey or Pollyanna-ish. I think Shad and I have both been called Pollyannas in our day. Um, but I think that's the reason we work so hard, and that's, that's the reason that we, we put so much into our work, because it matters. Um, and, and I can say that about uh, everybody in this room. The, uh, orientation I'll be talking about is, uh, in, in part, is America's, America's criminal class. Um, and the criminal class is defined uh, by punishment and the relationship between the individual and the state rather than criminal offending. Uh, Mark Twain famously said the only criminal class in America, does anybody know that one? Congress. Right, and that's the, uh, that's our, our criminal class. Um, here the, the story is really a racial story and a spatial story. Um, and, and I'll give you some sense, some sense for, of the geography involved here. Um, the, uh, the orientation is, is partly that, uh, that uh, developing a sense of citizenship, of connection, of, of social cohesion is a big part of the reentry and desistance experience. Um, uh, in many ways, we want uh, more citizens, uh, former prisoners or otherwise, who are active in civic life, productive at work, responsible in their family and in their community. Um, I may be neglecting the family a bit tonight, despite the fact that my wife is, is here watching me lecture. I'll, I'll focus more on the first two, on civic life and, and, uh, and work. Um, and I can, I can talk about other projects that, uh, that folks might have interest in uh, below there, um, just uh, touching on a few of the, of the topics that, I, that I've been engaged in. Okay, what do we mean about these public visions? Um, well, there's really two in uh, American sociology, and, and one is Herb Gans, um, who really argued that we need to be better writers, that we really need to um, either do the writing ourselves or to, or to work with writers who are better than us at communicating ideas. Um, the journals, as, as, as I think many of you will lament, are often impenetrable, um, and, and, and it's, it's quite difficult for us to reach the, the kinds of large audiences that we need to reach. Um, so his, his agenda was really an outreach agenda. Michael Borovoy, on the other hand, was, was much more about the co-production of knowledge and, and a more critical agenda about, about making change. Um, and I have it on good authority that, that both of them don't think what I'm doing is public sociology, so I, I'm sh quite sure I'm not doing it right. But I'll tell you what we try to do in Minnesota is really build an evidentiary base on issues of public concern. Um, so I've spent lots of, many years trying to estimate, for example, mundane figures, like the number of former prisoners within a geographic area, um, and, and try to... Uh, uh, theorize about that, of course, and try to make connections between um, the, the incarceration system and other systems in, in the social world. Um, but often, the most important thing is that for, for the journalists, for the, the policymakers, is they want a sense of scale or proportion or simple descriptive information that doesn't always fire up my colleagues and get them all interested. Um, so, there, so we try to build an evidentiary base. 
There's the societypages.org if folks are, are interested in, in, in that sort of work. I was already lobbying Shad to create a series of two-page research in brief um, from the fantastic work that's been done at the center here. Um, there, I, I, I was just so impressed with the, with the work presented. All 2012, 2013 work um, formed a th a, quite a thick booklet. There, there's um, a few copies left on this table for those who are interested. Yeah, I, I'd urge you, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's quite impressive. Um, in terms of, of, of public criminology, the, uh, the idea is really to have a research-driven reform efforts and, and uh, to help, in part, reframe the cultural image that's often quite mistaken of, of crime and justice. Um, for example, for the last 30 years, we've had a real revolution in understanding crime over the life course. Um, and how individuals age out or desist from crime, and many of you in this room have been part of that. And yet, too often, we tend to divide the world into two groups, the offenders, the non-offenders, and think that, boy, if we can just keep them apart forever, um, all will be well. Um, and, and so how do we penetrate the, those kind of deep, deeply held beliefs, however mistaken they may be? Well, often, I think research can play an important role. Um, and then also to recognize both the reality of crime and the social construction of crime. Um, and I, I, used, I used these terms, you know, I, I was writing a, a, the, the introduction to a book um, uh, and I raced off to class. It was a Tuesday night this fall and the title of my lecture was Crime as a Social Construction. So I walk up, unpack my bag, plug in my laptop and I look down and the, and the man in the first row, young Asian man, was completely beaten about the, the head and face. I mean, he, was, he, he had been attacked. He had been robbed brutally. And he was a very good student. Um, and so he literally you know, pulled the IV bags out of his arm to stumble to class, because uh, he didn't want to miss one class. And so I looked down at my notes, and, and I thought, well, yes, crime is a social construction, but it also hurts like hell. And, it's, and, and we have to engage that and remember that um, in our, our public in our public work. Um, so far from being ivory tower criminology or sociology, I want to engage both the re lived reality and the constructions of crime. Um, let me start with felon voting policy. Um, I will give uh, a, a bit of background. The, the, the figures here come from a, a report for the sentencing project in, in Washington that I prepared over the summer with uh, a, co a couple of terrific colleagues. Um, there's about 5.8 million Americans who are disenfranchised by virtue of a felony conviction, um, which is about 2.5% of the electorate overall. And I just want to draw your attention to the, to the pie chart um, to say that only about a fourth of those are currently incarcerated. And so I know that is the raging debate uh, around the UK, is whether prisoners should have the right to vote. Um, but in, in elsewhere, and in particular in the United States, um, we disenfranchise those who are on probation, who are on parole, and in a number of states, former prisoners, former felons who are completely, have met all their obligations to the state. Um, and you can see that makes up about 45% of the, of the total. Now, each state is, is quite a bit different. Um, and so the, um, so part of my, my engagement on this issue is to, is to visit different states and, and give testimony, try to give people a basic sense of, of how disenfranchisement affects their communities, their states. Um, and I, I began fairly agnostic on the issue, saying, uh, you know, we were writing a book, Jeff Manza and I, and we, we thought, well, the last chapter is what is to be done. We said, let's do, a, let's do a public opinion poll. We'll talk about that. But the weight of the evidence just pushed us to, uh, to make an argument really for reenfranchisement and to make an affirmative argument um, because the evidence was so strong, um, I think. I'll, I'll let you be the judge. But on, on the basis that reenfranchisement extends democracy, and I would apply this to prisoners as well in, in the current debate. Um, reduces racial disparities in access to the ballot, enhances uh, public safety, and we can certainly say that it does not compromise public safety, responds to public sentiment, accords with international standards and practices, and serves the reintegrative goals of community correction. So I'll, I'll try to make a, a very brief case along those lines. Um, with regard to extending democracy, the story is pretty simple. Um, 
in that before the incarceration boom, there was about a million Americans disenfranchised, quite, quite a, a fair number even then. Um, but since the 1970s, it's, it's uh, risen, risen quite dramatically. Even though the laws have gradually been pared back, the laws have gradually been liberalized in parts with the civil rights movement in the 1960s, 1970s. With regard to reducing, rate, reducing disparities, I just want to show I, I, I won't bore you with uh, all, of these, all of these state maps, but, but simply to, to show you the regionalization here that I, I was talking with uh, 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 a, a terrific uh, student in sociology today about the United States incarceration rate, and I said there really isn't one. There, there are many, and, and they're, all over the, uh, they're all over the map. Um, my home state of Minnesota is that uh, uh, in the center of the country we have a relatively um, low incarceration rate, but a high rate of correctional supervision. Um, many people on probation, often for long sentences in Minnesota. Um, if you add up everybody, this is, this is the percent of the electorate who's disenfranchised by virtue of a felony conviction overall in the states. And you can see there's some in the south and east, states like Florida, um, and others are quite a bit higher than, than elsewhere. If you look at African-American disenfranchisement, the picture is, is, is far darker. I've kept it on the same scale. You'd see that the, the, there are many states with over 20% of the African-American population who cannot vote due to a felony conviction. Um, we uh, have, have played with some uh, ways to try to dramatize this. I know that ma many of us, our eyes glaze over when we see numbers. Um, and so this is a cardiogram, um, a geographic technique that adjusts area for the density of, of uh, numbers in, a, in an area. And you can see, again, um, quite, quite a geographic pattern uh, that in which states shrivel if they have no disenfranchisement, no restrictions, and their prisoners can vote. Maine and Vermont are the only among those. And then quite, quite heavy disenfranchisement, um, over 10% overall. Um, if, if, they, if they have a disenfranchisement for life policy. Um, now, how to make change? Well, this is the sort of simple uh, graphic that I'll often present um, with regard to racial disparities. There was a bill um, before the legislature uh, that suggested we could re-enfranchise those who were on probation, on, on parole, who were in the community. Um, how would that affect the, the uh, uh, the rates of, of disenfranchisement, it would bring the African-American rate from 10% to 4%. It would bring the white rate from 1% to 0.4%. Um, very sim simply presenting this, this sort of information can often uh, make a difference. Um, now, the question that uh, I think um, is, is, is perhaps most controversial is whether political participation, political engagement, really plays a role in the desistance process. Um, and there's, there's good theory um, to suggest that it might, um, but it's a very difficult cl claim to make, and it's very difficult to compile the sort of evidence that needed, needed to, uh, uh, to, to make, that, make that inference. Um, the practicing citizenship might help build uh, political efficacy, civic efficacy, um, and reinforce one's identity as a citizen in good standing, um, standing shoulder to shoulder with your fellow citizens. Uh, might have an educative or constitutive role with the polity, um, and in part, perhaps, molds virtuous citizens. Uh, but that's only a piece of it. Um, it, it in criminology, um, I think that, that, that the uh, participation in, in military service doesn't just function as, say, a formal control, but it actually does tap into some of this engagement um, and really thicker participation than voting. Um, that is, uh, getting involved as, as political leaders, um, what McAvoy and, and Sherlow had des described as small p political leadership in, in um, one, of, one of their articles on, on reintegration uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, that, that indeed, I think we, we, we know from our, uh, our experiences uh, and, and watching people come through the system that it, it can play a role. Um, as well, I won't get into identity theory and, and Shad's work or, or Peggy Giordano. Um, I, I come from a symbolic interactionist orientation, so I, I tend to think of things as, uh, think of this as a, getting our reflected appraisals of self and taking on adult roles um, in communities. And we uh, often wear buttons to symbolize that we voted um, on election day, um, in part because of that civic pride. 
Um, one of my graduate students rather cheekily uh, suggested we could sell those buttons um, in part uh, so people could avoid all the trouble going, going to the polls. Um, I thought, well, that's uh, that, that, quite, a, quite an innovative idea, but probably best not to do. Um, so in the, what, what, is the, what does the, the evidence look like? In, in uh, the general population, we, found, we tried to track people leaving prison in Minnesota, and then we matched the, um, the, the records, the official voting records and the official Department of Corrections records, and we find that indeed former prisoners were turning out to vote, about one in five in most elections, and that they indeed had a lower recidivism rate. But what was really interesting was the time varying nature of this effect. That is that um, once people st were start beginning to vote, they, they were far less likely to reoffend, um, And we don't necessarily think that the, a the action of, 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 of uh, coloring in a form or, or pulling, a, pulling a lever is going to uh, magically transform individuals. Um, but it has a, 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 an effect that, that we can measure that's uh, on par with that of, of something like marriage. It's, it's very strong. Um, and, and the... And, and I think part of the reason for that is that it's been, it's been neglected in large part in criminological theory and criminological research. That voting is tapping into something, uh, some desire to be a part of a broader collectivity that is omitted from a standard recidivism model. And so I think that's the, the uh, 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 what I, all I can say when I testify on, on these issues is that, um, that opening up the doors to voting will not do demonstrable harm to public safety. But, but all of the evidence is suggesting um, that, that, it makes a, uh, uh, that it can make a positive difference. And um, in states in which uh, former, uh, in states in which people can vote while they're on parole or probation, the voters are far more likely to successfully complete uh, their, their term. Um, so what about responding to public sentiment? Um, we did a national public opinion poll um, and, and we found I, I'd be fascinated to know what the situation would be in, in Northern Ireland. Um, we asked about whether we split the sample, split a uh, thousand people four ways so that the answers wouldn't contaminate one another. And we asked who should be able to vote. Um, and we expect America is a very punitive nation. We expected people to be quite hostile to the idea of, of former prisoners voting. Um, but 80% uh, favored allowing people who were off paper to vote. Um, and, and good majorities, over 60% uh, uh, people favored uh, those who are on probation in lieu of a prison sentence or um, on parole following one. Um, at the prison gate, though, the, the, support really, the support really stopped, um, or at least went down to about a third. Um, the, the, uh, we also did some experiments in which we tried to vary the stigma. And we said, well, to what degree are people connecting particularly stigmatized groups like we asked about sex offenders. Should a sex offender be able to vote um, after serving their time? Um, we still found a majority favored, even in, as I say, in a very punitive nation, at a very punitive moment, um, that the, 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 the political participation is deeply prized. Um, now, obviously, uh, uh, there are, uh, the, the United States is quite unusual in disenfranchising um, so many and having such strict laws and then having such a large uh, correctional uh, uh, operation that um, the debate elsewhere is quite a bit around um, whether prisoners should be uh, permitted to vote or not. We did a, a little bit of analysis with this um, and, and found indeed it kind of unsurprisingly states with, with uh, uh, high democratization, um, and, and high GDP um, were more likely to re-enfranchise their prisoners. Um, states with high incarceration were more likely to disenfranchise. It's a very crude kind of analysis. Um, I wish I had some of the law students who I met with this morning who could tackle some of these uh, international, some of these constitutions around the world because frankly I was a little in, over my head in terms of, of, of trying to understand um, each of the provisions. Then finally, uh, I'll skip the figure there whether it would serve the reintegrative goals of community corrections. I, I just give you a, a quote um, from one of, one of my interviewees in, in Minnesota, a young, young man who uh, was really bewildered. I kind of picked up three themes um, when I asked 
prisoners and, and uh, probationers about, about voting, why they thought we had disenfranchisement laws. One was clearly race. People, you know, African American uh, uh, prisoners were, were convinced in large part that this was a, a, a simply another disenfranchisement effort in a, a, in a long line of them over the last couple hundred years. Um, I also heard themes of taxation without representation quite a bit for people who were on, on probation, who were working in the community and, and wanted to. And then I heard utter bewilderment um, that, uh, and, and Chris here, the uh, interviewee says, we're, what is the fear? Are we going to have some organized crime guy running for office and we're all going to get behind him? Is that really what, what, people, what people think of us? Um, because, of course, prisons are all about difference. They're not about the idea that, uh, that, that folks are going to band together in and, and, and insufficient numbers to unseat a local sheriff, for example. Um, so the, so I, I hear this in, in the states. I also I, I, I did not get Cormac's permission to use this, uh, use this quote. Um, so, but hopefully he won't mind. Uh, he's writing a new book on, on disenfranchisement. Um, and, and his, his prisoner Gavin, uh, the, the prisoner that he quotes, um, says much the same thing as, as, as Chris does, um, allows a prisoner to vote for and against changes which may affect his or her time in custody and upon release. Hope the vote is not a wasted one. Um, so there is a, um, there is a, a deeply felt idea here, um, uh, certainly by those, by those behind bars. Um, but there is a great deal of change, and as, as everyone here knows, the European Court of Human Rights is, is dead, dead sent against, against uh, uh, disenfranchisement of, of, of prisoners. Um, I, read, I read about David Cameron's uh, rather visceral reaction to the idea of, of prisoners voting. Um, but in the States, um, there's been tremendous, tremendous change since, at least since I started studying this, these issues in the late 1990s. Nine states have repealed or reduced their lifetime bans. A couple more have extended voting rights to persons under probation or parole supervision. Eight states um, eased the restoration process after completion of sentence. So all told, about 800,000 citizens have regained their, their rights in recent years. Um, so so I, I don't want it to all be doom, doom and gloom. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and say, move from the civic realm to the socioeconomic realm and really talk a, a bit about work because work is, is, is absolutely fundamental um, to prisoner reentry. Um, and the, the, uh, uh, and, and I, I think we, we've got um, some interesting uh, developments in recent years in this area that um, many of you might be familiar with Diva Pager's um, audit study in which she sent out um, identical, uh, otherwise identical African American and white pairs of testers and varied whether they reported a prison record in applying for jobs. Um, and she found both a stigma effect and a race effect so that if you look at that graph, the white graph suggests that 34% of the white job applicants who had no criminal record received a positive callback from employers. Their matched pair in the experiment um, who, who reported a, a prison conviction a conviction for, for a, a felony drug crime in prison time, that dropped to 17%. These were all low-level, entry-level type jobs. For African Americans, the, the, it was about 14% of those with who, who, who had no criminal record um, received a positive callback from employers, and then about 5% for those with a, uh, who did report the record. So um, the argument is that African American men with criminal records are often um, uh, uh, utterly disqualified from positions. Um, good study and, and wanted to probe, the, um, probe this issue further because there's been an incredible proliferation of low-level records um, in, in the system. And, I, and, and I, I'd say the, the majority of US employers, it's now quite clear, are checking for even the, the most simple entry-level job. Um, so estimates upwards of 60% are now checking for uh, uh, working in a hamburger place or something like that. Um, this is a historic change. Um, and he, when, I, when I was a young, a, a young man applying for jobs, it would have taken um, an employer would have to go to our courthouse, um, hand over some paperwork, and spend pretty much the better half part of the afternoon uh, trying to determine my criminal record. Now it's, it's a few keystrokes, and most employers have 
everything on file. They have a contract with agencies that will provide this information. Um, and it, it, it not only includes convictions, it includes all arrests. Um, it includes, uh, uh, it, it, it does not uh, sunset at any time. It, it, stays, on, it stays on forever. Um, so one of my questions was whether employers cared about the very least, the least serious re records. And, and, I, and I, say, I took this up partly because I, I really wanted the sort of evidence that I could go uh, uh, to policymakers with and say, well, if, if indeed employers are attending to these records even when there is no conviction, even when they're many years old, um, that might be the impetus for change. Um, I know in, in the UK the situation is, is quite a bit different. Um, that you have the Re Rehabilitation of Offenders Act of 1974, that the, the many convictions at least are spent over time or reduced. Uh, we don't have that situation in the state. Um, Elena Larari is doing some work in Spain on, on this issue um, uh, and, and suggests that it's almost complete disqualification from public employment um, with a little more opening for private employment. So I know this issue is, is uh, uh, coming elsewhere. I, I do want to just pause on arrest, though, for a moment. Um, and, I, and I apologize for all the bar charts and figures. This is how my mind works. Um, I, I think Shad and I probably differ in, in how we, that we present evidence. But, but the, the, uh, this is simply in my home state, which is a relative, known as a progressive state in the United States, um, that we have an annual arrest rate of 227 per thousand for African Americans. So that is, that's not saying 22.7% because some people go through the system more than once, but it is saying that if you take the total number of arrests divided by that population, you'll, you'll get 227. Um, and you can see the disparities there. We also have a large American Indian population in, in that state. Um, the incarceration rate is, is listed below that. It's about 13.7. And so the arrest affects a far broader uh, set, of, set of individuals. Um, the, the, it's likely to affect um, uh, university, individuals applying for university in coming years as, these, as technology makes routine checking all the more uh, easy to do. And it may really uh, be locking, locking people out. Uh, what, what are these arrests for? I won't uh, uh, belabor the point. Um, the one I focused on, about 16% of them are the, the, what we consider index crimes or part one serious crimes. Most of those are larceny theft, but that also is the category that includes robbery, burglary, aggravated assault. Um, the disorderly conduct is the, the offense we chose when we went for the lower bound of stigma. We wanted to know, um, we tried to get something that wouldn't push uh, buttons about theft or that wouldn't push buttons about sexuality. Um, so we didn't use trespassing, which is something that is a low-level offense, but it often um, is, is, is charged along with sex crimes. Um, so we chose disorderly conduct, which uh, is, is to some degree a, a generic hell-raising kind of um, uh, uh, crime. The idea was we, we recruited uh, university students. We uh, 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 varied their we had them rehearse. We turned them all into uh, tremendous actors. Um, we initially tried to hire actors to go out and apply for jobs, uh, but they were far too temperamental. We, we simply, uh, <laughs> and we couldn't tell if they were making up stories when they'd call in sick, you know. So, um, so we, we found uh, uh, sociology and criminology students. We had them rehearse over and over again their basic work records, their identities. Um, and then we had them convey a three-year-old disorderly conduct arrest with no uh, subsequent conviction. Um, and the, we did focus groups quite a bit to see how people were conveying their records. It was really no, no issue because um, so many places are checking that it's, it's quite natural for people to come forward now and, and disclose a, re a record immediately rather than to have it come through in the background check. Um, we rotated the testers each week to simply so that we wouldn't pick up any tester effects so that you might be the, the person with the arrest record one week and the person without the next. Um, well, what did we see? We found far smaller effects of stigma when we reduced the, the arrest. We, our, our, ab, our white uh, uh, testers, it was about 30, 39% got a callback, a positive callback versus 35% 
uh, of those who reported an arrest record. Um, among our African Americans, it was about 20, 28% and 24%, so a similar kind of gap. Um, but it did tell us that employers are becoming more sophisticated in calibrating the degree, uh, uh, the degree of stigma and the degree of harm. Um, we did uh, quite a few employer interviews as well. We, we followed up with these employers after we audited them. Um, we found that uh, two-thirds of our employers had contracts with private data mining companies that make it very easy to just run everybody through the background check. Um, and 25% of them told us that any sort of record would disqualify an individual from, uh, uh, from, from consideration. Now this surprised us because social scientists, we often think of social desirability biases around discrimination, particularly. Uh, we, we're, 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 more, we're less likely to tell an interviewer that we're, we, would dis we would discriminate than we might actually be in practice. That's why we do audit studies and, and do this experimentally, um, uh, because we can't take those at, at face value. But people were cr quite upfront with, their, um, with, with, with the way that they felt here. And I mean, I say everyone deserves a second chance. This was a typical sentiment, just not here. You know, that, that that's the, um, uh, hey, I understand the issue, um, but we can't have any, any sort, anything like that um, here. Um, but the, the, what I think is, is perhaps a bit more promising is that this is quite a bit overstated in, in some way. That what we found when we, when we modeled who got the jobs, and, and this is a tip for the, the students uh, perhaps especially, that personal contact is the strongest predictor of getting the offer. That is asking to speak with the hiring authority, asking to get another application for a friend, making that contact. Um, really swamps the other characteristics. Um, but it is, as I say, an unusual case, at least uh, uh, for us, where the stated discrimination exceeds the actual discrimination in practice. Um, so what, what's the change, and this is the reason I wanted to talk about this today, as of uh, May 14th, uh, we just passed a ban the box legislation in, in Minnesota, um, getting criminal history off the application forms. Um, so took this research, and said, um, we think people are being screened out, and if they only had the opportunity to make contact, they might have brighter, brighter prospects. Um, now this doesn't mean, though, that the employers cannot check the record. What it means is that they cannot ask them for the record on the form, and that they have to wait until an interview or finalist stage to bring up criminal history. That is, so, this, so that you get past the initial screen where the, the application just goes into the dustbin. Um, it's currently been the law for public employers in, in the state of Minnesota. It'll be extended to private employers in, in January. Um, we, uh, we don't know, you know, I, part, of, part of the effort that, that, that motivates me is I said, well, is, is 4%, that 4% gap meaningful? And then I thought about my own job search in academia that I would have done anything to get a 4% uh, extra, extra boost or, um, and as well that if you, if you um, divide that 4% by the base rate of 28%, it's really more like 14% uh, uh, penalty. Um, so this is an effort to get people screened out, at least give them the opportunity to make contact. Now, is it going to offer a real opportunity or is it going to just shift the discrimination down the road? We don't know the answer to that yet. That's, I, hope, I hope I'll be invited back. I'd be, I'd be delighted to, uh, to share that, uh, that information with you. So there, there are many challenges here in particularly balancing the legitimate rights of social groups and private citizens. Um, but hopefully the, the, we can have a research-based policy conversation about this. And then to recognize that you know, the, the laws um, that, that we engage here are not just the furniture in the room, but they're, they're dynamic, they change, and, and we have some agency in, in, in helping that happen. And I, I, I've had so many people when I talk about the technology of criminal record checking say, well, the genie's out of the bottle on that one and, and you'll, never, you'll never be able to regulate stigma. But, but I disagree, I think we do quite a good job of it in many, in many spheres, in particular with regard to our healthcare records, that, that we have been able to maintain some privacy uh, around those and I think we could do the same if there is the will to do it with, with criminal records. Um, so at minimum, I mean, the, the idea here is that, uh, uh, that we can reduce, uh, we can curb some of the excess stigma, get the arrest records off of those, those um, public 
just public documents, uh, get the misdemeanors off, and, and really have some, some time limited, um, uh, time, time limited rather than lifetime bans. Um, and I'll say, you know, curbing excess stigma also has many, many other positive effects. Um, I can show just one graphic um, uh, in, 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 as part of uh, uh, U.S. welfare reform. Um, one punitive measure that was taken was to ban public assistance for anyone convicted of not all felonies, but, it, but drug felonies. There was a great concern with drugs, and so it, it, it made the, um, so we imposed a ban. You could no longer get food stamps or um, uh, uh, public assistance for, uh, uh, if you'd been convicted of a drug felony. Well, states had, uh, states varied in their implementation of this, and the states that opted out tended to have relatively flat crime rates among, uh, arrest rates among women. Um, the states that imposed the ban, we saw an immediate spike um, that persisted. And, and, the, the, and so stigma here is, is um, uh, as I say, something not, not to be taken lightly or to think that we can somehow partition the justice system from the other institutions of society. Um, and uh, so I, I, won't, I won't dwell on this research. I'll save it again for another time. Um, the, so, so the idea here um, that tried to at least, at least raise is that um, there's so much work to be done in building this sort of evidentiary base and, the, and, the, uh, and, and doing the translational work that's going to get the numbers out into the community. Um, it's, it's absolutely critical and, and as folks here know, um, uh, if you're, if you're um, looking at human rights violations or even if you're counting deaths, um, that it's, it's, it's absolutely critical that social scientists be um, on the front lines and making sure that it's good science behind the numbers that are reported. Um, even if sometimes it's, it's rather unglamorous work and, and I've been accused of, of running a sweatshop on the 11th floor of the social science tower um, where I keep people engaged in all these spreadsheets all day long. Um, uh, but, they, but they do uh, desist eventually and get jobs, hopefully. Um, the, the other issue that I just bring, it's not just engaging the problems of public concern as they come to us, but building interest and energy around problems that have escaped public attention. Um, and, and here I'd say felon voting restrictions is, is a big one. People, as I say in, in the states at least, would have thought of it as the furniture in the room. We've always had these laws, everybody has these laws, and it really takes an, edu an education effort to say, well, you know, really, there's, a, there's several states and, and many nations that don't impose a restriction on the franchise. Um, and then to document some of the problems with piling on. And that's, uh, piling on is a, an American football term. I, I, I asked my son whether he's a rugby, a rugby player, whether, whether there was a, a, an equivalent, um, but it's a, it's a penalty to, to hit, hit somebody late um, when, they're already, when they're already on the ground. Um, and, and, and so many of so many of the efforts to impose greater stigma are uh, of this nature. Um, the, and then finally, engaging some of the broader impacts of the criminal justice system. Um, I, 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 I'm afraid I'm not pre presenting a very favorable portrait of my, of my home country, but the, my current grant is on the health effects of incarceration and how incarceration affects community health. And we, we were struck by, um, uh, sadly, that uh, that, that the health care that's provided in prison is far, far superior to the health care that's provided on the outside for those who are, who are going to prison. And so we actually found positive effects of, of incarceration on community health, um, at least for those diseases that are tested and treated in prisons, like tuberculosis, like some of the STDs. Um, for things that aren't tested and treated in prisons, having a prison in the area had, had, had dramatically negative effects. So I, I, I want to close with just a few um, uh, uh, other examples on, on uh, of how sometimes the, the policy change works um, with uh, uh, some humility here because most of them I had very little to do with. But, um, but my favorite comes from the state of Iowa. It's a farm state near, near my, my uh, hometown of St. Paul, Minnesota, that uh, uh, I got a call one day from the governor's um, attorney. And the governor's attorney said, call off those kids. Call off those kids. They're bugging me. I'm sick of it. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And the kids in, in question here were um, high school students in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, who made felon disenfranchisement, felon voting restrictions, their class project. 
And so they were going to lobby the governor, and they were going to lobby every legislator. And they did so by sending them my articles. And so I was incurring the wrath. They thought I had an army of, of uh, youth who were, who were doing this. I had no clue. Uh, and and the, the, uh, I was working at the time with a team from New York University, some of the finest legal minds doing civil rights law, human, human rights law, um, trying to uh, attack the practice. And the, ki the, the kids lobbying the governor came upon a novel one. He said, well, why don't you just do a blanket pardon? Governors have the power of pardon. And so July 4th, he, the governor signs a, signs a law that, that uh, uh, effectively pardoned 100,000 people um, for purposes of civil rights, and they were able to vote. None of the, uh, at least none of the, the attorneys who I, I was working with had anything like that. Um, instead, um, I worked in Florida quite a bit. I did a 14-hour deposition with a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, uh, I got out of it, and I was all tired. I, I'm, I'm, I, I had a tendency to try to teach the, uh, uh, the opposing counsel um, rather than simply ex answer the questions, which is terrible for a, a, an expert to do. Um, so it was grueling. And, and we walked out, and, and, and when... when um, the, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. Um, I got a call from the, I, I called the attorney. I said, I was so disappointed. I said, all that work, all that preparation. Said, oh, we knew we were going to lose. Like, we, 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 you didn't think we were going to win, did you? Did you really think? I mean, the law is clear. And I said, well, why did we do all this? He said, well, it's body blows. It's really working the body as a boxer might, and, and eventually um, things will happen. Um, and, and indeed, about a half million people did get their rights restored in Florida. Shortly after that, um, I can uh, 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 then tell you a little bit more about Minnesota. One, one uh, testimony, one, one bit of testimony I did on a, on a re uh, voting rights restoration bill, um, I was asked um, whether the bill would cover a, a Minnesota probationer who was on probation for treason. I don't know if you've heard that one, but I, I, I had no idea, I said. I don't think we've, we've had a lot of treason cases in Minnesota. I don't think they'd be given probation. Um, and it turns out the last one was a University of Minnesota professor in World War I. Um, but I wrote about it. I blogged about it. Maybe this is some of the public outreach efforts. And Al Franken, the now senator, at the time he had a national radio show, and he just had so much fun with the idea that, uh, uh, that, that they were asking me about treason. And, and, and we had, had several, days of, several days of shows on this. Um, then I can say uh, uh, a bit more just about Tennessee. Um, sometimes when these laws, the importance of, of really bringing the, the, the suggested reform to the people most affected by it. Um, I was asked to attend a, uh, a law school presentation, or, or give a law school presentation in Memphis, um, Tennessee, after a, um, uh, the law had been uh, proposed to ease the rights restoration process for people, and these were people who'd completed their sentences. Um, and so I said I would, I would go, I would only have a few, uh, a few uh, uh, I didn't expect a large audience, um, but instead there were like 300 um, former felons who, who had showed up, and, and they were very angry because at the last minute, um, one of the politicians had attached a, a provision to the bill that said you had to be current on your child support, you had to have paid off all your obligations um, to, uh, before you could be considered to have your rights restored, and that the child support obligation continues to accrue during the time in which you are incarcerated. So many of them had tens of thousands of dollars over their head, um, and they, and they um, certainly viewed uh, uh, me as being some part of that in, in crafting this law. Um, but it, but I, I can see the, the uh, uh, clearly people are resisting some of these rules, and, and um, the need for dialogue is important in Northern Ireland as, as well as, as the United States. Um, so I will uh, leave it at there, there for the moment, and I've got a million more stories, but I, I really want to hear and have a dialogue with you. Thank you.